with you tonight and I sure have enjoyed the singing and the testimonies and it's been a blessing to my heart and encouragement to me and my wife we're thankful that we've been invited and uh, we're thankful to be able to share God's word with you tonight I'd like for you to take the Bible and turn with me to the book of Romans Romans chapter 10 I want to say thank you for your faithfulness as I look across the congregation. I see many folks that I saw years and years ago. I'm unsure how long it was uh, when Brother Holly asked me to come and preach revival. I see Miss Nan all the way back in the back. I just see you. Glad to see you. Glad you're here tonight. And thank you for your faithfulness and uh, committed to the Lord's work. Becky, I'm glad to see you tonight. And uh, I guess uh, Becky and I went to church together uh, when we were children and I'm thankful for that. And I've known Rick for many, many years and we're glad. Uh, uh, glad to have Brother Bill. And I forgot your last name again. Beckett. Beckett. I've known Brother Beckett for many years as well. And I'm thankful for that. And of course, uh, Miss Davis. And what a blessing and encouragement your husband was to me. And uh, what a man of God. And I'm honored and privileged to be able to be with you tonight and thank the Lord for that. We'll look at a very familiar passage of Scripture this evening. Romans chapter 10. I want to begin reading in verse number 9. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all, I'm sorry, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse 13, what a great verse. I hope that you have it memorized. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let me ask you tonight, have you already prayed? Have you already sought the Lord? Have you asked him to speak to your heart tonight? Uh, praying pews and praying pulpits make a great partner. They have to go together. It's one thing for the preacher to pray. But the pulpit is not the only place. It's not the only source of prayer. And let me ask you tonight to pray with me. There's something we can all do together at the same time to influence and change heaven. And that's pray. May we pray together. Father in heaven, I come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the opportunity to present the word of God. And Lord, to preach the great, beautiful passage of Romans chapter 10. Father, I pray tonight that you'd help me to be an encouragement. Help me to be a blessing. Help me, Lord, to be a source of help and strength strength for this congregation tonight. I pray as we look at these beautiful verses that our hearts would be encouraged and challenged to present the gospel and Lord to get the great news of the gospel out to a lost and dying world. I love you Lord and I thank you for bleeding and dying for me. I thank you for my salvation. Thank you Lord for my home in heaven. Thank you for the assurance that we have that we're saved because of the eternal word of God. Help us Lord to rejoice in it this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you were to ask where to turn in the Bible to take someone down the path of salvation, you'd obviously turn to the book of Romans. Many folks start in the book of John because they like to start with good news, and I do as well. But we see man's greatest need, and we see God's clear plan of salvation presented for us in the book of Romans. As a matter of fact, the clearest verses in all the Bible on how to get to heaven, we just read them. As a matter of fact, if you'll just 
just take what the Bible says, what God gave us, you'll know exactly what to do to get to heaven simply by reading the verses that we just read. Would you look again with me at verse 9? The Bible gives us a very great definition of salvation and how to be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So there's two elements there involved. Uh, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. Those two things are essential for salvation. You have to believe that Jesus died. He was buried and that he rose again from the grave. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter what you believe. No other belief will get you to heaven. The object of our faith must be the finished work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you tonight, what are you trusting in? If you were to say, Brother Fred, let me put my finger on the very one thing that I'm depending on or trusting in to take me to heaven, it better be the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can come tonight and get your soul uh, forever set at peace with God by putting your faith and trust in Him and Him alone. There is no other that we can turn to. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only at the name of Jesus. It's only in the person of Jesus uh, that a man finds salvation. But notice what it says in uh, verse number 9. It says, Thou shalt be saved. I like the way God puts it. I'm glad that God put things in a simple way, aren't you? The simplicity of the gospel is an amazing thing. Even though God places it and puts it out for us in such a simple matter, it's a great thing. The Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say might be saved. It doesn't say could be saved. It says shalt be saved. Listen, if you doubt your salvation night, it's because your faith is not in the facts. Your faith cannot be based on anything thing other than the facts and that's the word of God. And God says that if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, then he'll save us from our sin. Notice the next verse. It's a basic repeat. Uh, verse number 10 has the elements backwards. It says in verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And by the way, that's the key word throughout all the New Testament. Believeth. We can take you to verse after verse through the New Testament and understand that that is the key word that is associated with salvation. It's our faith. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many are trusting in themselves to take themselves to heaven. If there was anything that a man could do to get to heaven, there was uh, the, the death of Jesus Christ was pointless. If there was a thing that a man could do to earn or merit salvation, Jesus died in vain. But I want you to understand that man has no hope, not some hope, not a little hope, but no hope outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says here in verse 10, it says, For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation. And then let's skip down to verse 13, and I want you to see how clear the Word of God is. The Bible says, for whosoever, and I'm glad that includes me and you. I'm glad that includes mountain folks, aren't you? I'm glad that includes folks from Raleigh County, West Virginia. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, Brother Fred, I knew all that. I know you did. I understand you're on your way to heaven, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, putting your faith and trust and confidence in him fully and completely but there is a context there is a context that's associated with these verses that everyone usually misses the work of salvation is a beginning work the work of salvation is where God starts not where he ends God didn't save you just to save you there's so much more to our salvation than just the fact that we're on our way to heaven Oh, God help us if we think, oh, I'm saved from hell and I'm on my way to heaven and that's the end. Oh, there's so much more to that, more to it than that. I want you to notice with me the next verse. It says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him and believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, verse 15 is the text for the message tonight. The Bible says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Tonight, I want to mention just briefly 
in a humorous way about the ordinances. I'm thankful tonight we have the Lord's Supper. I look forward to that. And uh, the Lord's Supper is the time when we remember the body of Christ which was broken for us. Bread uh, that is uh, without leaven. Leaven throughout the scriptures is a picture of sin. We find the sinless body of Christ. Amen. And then we'll drink fruit of the vine. Uh, incorrupted or uh, we drink fruit of the vine that has not had anything added to it that would cause it to ferment or to be corrupted which is a beautiful picture of the blood of Jesus Christ which was perfect blood spotless blood uh, blood that is uh, needed to wash away our sin I'm thankful for that ordinance the scripture gives us another ordinance and that's the ordinance of baptism and I, I want to really confuse you and you better turn your hearing uh, aids up and you better make sure you're uh, right on track. Now I want you to understand that good Baptist people have more than two ordinances. Yeah, good, good Baptist people have more than two ordinances. Now I've already read about your feet, okay? So don't get too nervous. We're not going to be washing anybody's feet. <laughs> But there is another ordinance, and I hope that you, uh, I hope that you took part in that today. And that's a good old-fashioned Sunday afternoon nap. Amen. <laughs> I hope that you were able to participate in that this evening. How many of you got your nap tonight? Good. Rest it up, boy. I tell you what, I'm thankful the Lord gave us a day to rest, aren't you? Now I'm picking about the ordinance part. I hope you understand and see that. <laughs> But I figured if we're talking about communion and I look behind me and see the baptistry and we've got feet mentioned and now I could just mention taking a nap for just a moment and throw you off really good. But uh, I want you to look at this verse in detail. And it kind of threw me off for a long time, Brother Beckett. It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Now if I were to take a poll, and even if it was a private poll, if I were to say, How many of you in here would like for me to take my shoes off and you guys take a good look at my feet? <laughs> I would guess there wouldn't be a single person in the entire room that'd be interested in looking at my feet. <laughs> Brother Becca, what do you think? <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, thank you for your honesty. As a matter of fact, I don't know of any preacher that I've ever met, and I've met some preachers, and preachers are weird creatures. You know that, right? Preachers, there's just something a little different about preachers of the gospel. I've met a bunch of them. I've been around a whole lot of them. As a matter of fact, I've stayed in dorms with them and in motel rooms with them, and I've been around preachers all my life, but now I want to tell you something. I've never met a preacher and I've looked at their feet and just said to myself, boy, those are beautiful feet. As a matter of fact, when I think about feet, the very best thing that you can do is just cover them up. When I think about feet, I think about socks and I say, praise the Lord. I don't even think about open toe shoes. I just think, man, keep them things covered, you know? Keep them covered. And you know, when I get to thinking about this verse, it just throws me for a loop. And the Bible says here, it says, in the sight of God at least, in verse number 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And then it goes on to say, and bring glad tidings of good things. The word gospel means good news. We understand according to the book of Corinthians that the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't leave out any part of it or you don't have the gospel at all. It's not the full gospel, a third gospel, or half gospel. It's just the gospel. If you leave out the death of Christ, then you don't have the gospel. If you leave out the burial of Christ, you don't have the gospel. If you leave out the resurrection of Christ, you don't have the gospel. But the good news of the Word of God is that Jesus died for us. Amen? That Jesus was buried and that He rose again from the grave. That's the gospel and it's good news. And He did it for you and I. He did it specifically for us personally. I'm thankful that Jesus did that. That's the gospel. When I think about the gospel, I think about this passage of scripture. When you look at God's plan of salvation, it's wrapped around the feet of the preacher. See, understand that the clearest verses in all the Bible, the clearest verses in all the Bible that tell us how to get to heaven are associated with the feet of the preacher. Understand that God gave us a specific book in the Bible that deals with salvation more than any other book. It's called the book of Romans. And in this very precious and very sacred passage, if there's a person in the room that's ever taken a gospel track or took up the time to show someone else how to get to heaven, they've used this passage of Scripture to do it. And I want you to understand that God took this very dynamite power passage of Scripture and put it around the feet 
of the preacher. And let me say, it's the presentation of the gospel. Yeah. It's the presentation of the gospel that makes the feet beautiful. Yeah. I understand it's not the feet themselves, but it's what the feet carry right. that make them beautiful. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've seen some pretty ugly feet, and to be honest about it, there's a lot of Christians that have ugly feet because they don't carry what they should carry. I want to have beautiful feet. I want to have beautiful feet that carry the good news. I want to have beautiful feet that carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. Do you know you can't even spell the word gospel without go? G-O. Let me share with you something. Would you turn back with me to the book of Matthew? Matthew chapter 28. And we understand what this is. This is the clearest, uh, this is the clearest presentation of the, uh, of the Great Commission of anywhere in the Scripture. Matthew chapter 28, just two verses. And I want you to look at the wording here. The Bible says in Matthew 28 and verse 19, Go ye therefore... And that's the first part of the gospel. Go. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I want to mention the first thing about these feet. And the first thing about these feet are their tracks. I want to talk about foot tracks for a little bit. You know, you can, you can tell if there's a real preacher around. But you know why? Because he leaves tracks. He sure does. You know, if you're following a real preacher, guess what you're going to find? It won't be long. It won't be far behind. You'll find a track left somewhere. So they'll, they'll be getting the gospel out somewhere. They leave tracks everywhere they go. Do you know that? No, I'm not talking about those kind of tracks. I'm talking about foot tracks. They sure do. Uh, preachers make tracks. Now, is there anyone here that might happen to be a school teacher? Uh, my wife is. Oh, good. What do you teach? Pre-K. Pre-K. All right. Good deal. Well, I want to mention to you that when you look at the gospel, it is surrounded by four very important words, and all those words are verbs. Each one of them. Would you take your Bible and mark it with me tonight? I want you to see that the feet of the preacher are beautiful because of these verbs. Notice in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, would you mark the first one? Go. That's the first one word. You, God has commanded us to go. As a matter of fact, it's impossible to be right with God unless you're going with the gospel. Can y'all turn that mic up? They didn't hear that. It's not even working, brother. Let me repeat that. Let me see if you got it. It's impossible to be right with, the, with God unless you're going with the gospel. Well, that's not a popular message, is it? Do you know you're outside of God's will if you're not carrying the gospel on, with your feet? Do you realize you're not the Christian that God saved you to be unless you're presenting the gospel, unless you're sharing the gospel? Boy, that's not popular, is it? Have you wondered? Have you questioned? Wait a minute. Am I right with God? Am I in God's will? Well, it's very simple. If you're not fulfilling these verbs or if you're not uh, following through with God's plan with the Great Commission, it's impossible to be right with Him because God gave a Great Commission. God gave It's great for many reasons. It's great because of who gave it. That's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's great because of when He gave it. He gave it right before He ascended back to heaven. It's great because of how many times it's been given. It was given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. All of those care for us, the Great Commission, is great because who it was given to. That was the disciples and the apostles. It was great because who it was commissioned to, and that's the local New Testament church. It's the Great Commission, and the Bible says, go! And as a church, we can't be right with God unless we're going with the gospel. I understand that God has left with us the most precious commodity on the face of the earth, and it's the good news. It's the message that Jesus died. He was buried and rose again for our sin. The second word, would you mark it? Teach. God says He not only wants us to go with this message, but He wants us to teach it. We have the responsibility of uh, teaching the Word of God to others. We are to get the message. We're talking about these feet track or foot tracks made by the preacher. Oh, he's going, going, going with the gospel. Going, going, going with the good news. And what's he doing as he goes? He, he's teaching the Word of God. May God help us to teach what we know in our heart to others. Do you know one of the very first things you ought to do whenever you uh, lead someone to the Lord is you ought to teach him to do the same thing you just did? You say, Fred, how do you get that? Because it's right here in the Scripture. It says teaching them 
them in verse number 20, and I skipped one. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Uh, we're to teach others as we lead someone to Christ. We're to teach them to carry the gospel as well. And then look at the one I skipped. Go back in verse number 19, and would you mark the word baptizing? Understand that the word gospel and the Great Commission is filled with action words. Uh, we're to go. We're to teach. We're to baptize, and then we're to teach them to observe all things. Uh, that's the foot tracks of a preacher. Uh, that's movement. That's getting those feet moving. In the eyes of God, feet that are moving with the gospel. In the eyes of God, feet that are carrying the eternal word of God are beautiful feet. There's a problem though. I want you to turn back with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Would you look with me there? Romans chapter 10 verse 17. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 10 and verse 15. It says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let me ask you something. Not only do we see feet, feet trouble, I want to give you a second thing. There's uh, feet tracks, but I want you to see feet trouble. How many of you ever had trouble with your feet? It's no good, is it? You know, every once in a while I get gout in my right toe. I don't know why it's in your right toe. The Lord has a funny way, you know, getting your attention. You'd be laying in bed, everything would be just all fine and dandy. How I many anybody ever had problems with gout? Bless your heart. Man, it's it's such a good thing you've never experienced that. You'll be laying there and out of the clear blue sky, it'll be just like a strobe light that comes on with just I mean, I'm telling you, a powder puff can't touch it. I'm telling you, you can't take a powder puff and touch that thing. No sheets, no blankets. It don't matter how cold it is outside. It don't matter how what you got the heat setting on. No, you ain't touching that tub. Because let me tell you something. Not only do we see feet tracks, but we see feet trouble. There's a problem. There's a problem with Christians, and that's the problem of the day, is we've got feet problems. Their, their feet are not too beautiful. Their feet are not pretty in the eyes of God. You know why? Because they're not making tracks. You know the very first thing that you're going to have problems with and to stop you in the work of God is your feet. It's the very first thing you're going to have trouble with, your feet. You know why? Because they get cold. How many of you like to hunt? Anybody like to hunt other than me? Well, I've spent many a day out in the woods. And you know, I've been in the woods before and the temperature be pretty cold. I'll be out in the tree stand or wherever. And you know, as far as my body goes, I think to myself, I can handle this pretty good. That's no problem. Next thing I know, I'll be sitting there for a while and boy, my feet start getting cold. You me tell you how, let me tell you how you can gauge the temperature of your heart. Right here, your feet. That's exactly right, your feet. May God help us to understand as soon as our heart starts to get cooled off, as soon as we're not right with God, the very first thing that will go is our feet. Did you know in the military years ago they used to have feet inspection? Anybody ever in the military never heard that before? Feet inspection in the military? You know, they'll teach you how to keep your feet clean. They'll teach you how to keep them dry. As a matter of fact, that they'd go by once a night. Somebody told me it was at midnight. They'd wake you up in the middle of the night, get you out of the bed, and have you to look at your feet to make sure your feet were okay. Because they understand if a soldier's feet are not right, they can't go into battle. If a, if a soldier's feet begin to get blistered or begin uh, sore, that type of thing, they're not going to be ready to do battle against the enemy. Let me tell you something, your feet, you've got to watch them. Your feet will get cold before anything else. And, and, and there's a good indication whether or not you're right with God is your feet got cold. How are you carrying the gospel tonight? You say, Brother Fred, I used to be a soul winner. I used to take the word of God out and share it with people. Well, let me tell you something, your feet got cold. You say, Brother Fred, I used to love to tell other people about my Savior and what He did for me. You know what the problem is? Your feet got cold. Your feet get cold. You know, another problem with your feet is they get dirty. You know, another reason why I don't like to see somebody's feet is I just associate that with stink. <laughs> Absolutely. Man, I think when I think of stock, when I think of socks, I think about stench. I can't help it. That's just what I think about. There ain't not a person in this room wants me to take my shoes off. <laughs> and listen, and here's the reason why. Because your feet will get dirty faster than you think. You know, I took a shower right before I came here. And you know, as far as I know, I wore deodorant and everything. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad for deodorant? Man, isn't it a great generation that we live in? We've got deodorant. Hallelujah. And sh I even use shampoo. I know that sounds crazy, but I still use it. It's head and shoulders. Because I, I, you know, I got some on the back and then on my shoulders I use it, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> I like taking a bath. And you know, to be honest about it, I feel perfectly clean right now, but if I take my shoes off, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable. You know why? I'm afraid my feet might stink. <laughs> Do you know in the Old Testament, there was a, a building called the Tabernacle. 
The Old Testament tabernacle didn't have a floor in it. Did you know that? There were a few things it didn't have. Never had a seat. Never had a window. It didn't have a floor. And you know, inside that Old Testament tabernacle, one of the very first things, the very first thing that you'd come up against was what was called the laver. It was a bathtub like for your feet and for your hands. Before they could go into the presence of God, the very first duty that God gave them to do was wash your feet. And do you know what? As soon as they'd wash their feet, guess what? They'd take those feet and immediately those feet would come right directly back in contact with the ground. Sure. A great and beautiful picture of our need to be cleansed on a regular and daily basis. In John chapter 13, you'll find the great story of Jesus girding himself and washing the disciples' feet. And the reason why it was such a big deal to Jesus, and the reason why he said uh, to Peter, look, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you don't have any part with me. And then when Peter went the extra mile and said, don't wash just my feet, but wash me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, Jesus says, no, that's not necessary. You're clean all except your feet. In other words, you're saved and on your way to heaven. But you need to have the right fellowship with me. You need to keep your feet clean. Oh, we need to make feet tracks or foot tracks, but we also need to recognize that as a Christian, our troubles will begin with our feet. When we present the gospel, God gives us a burden for the lost. When we present the gospel, when we go with gospel tracks and with the word of God, God does something in our heart. And let me tell you, if it's been a while since you've presented the word of God to someone else, then you've got feet trouble. And feet trouble is a dangerous thing. Uh, it's a problem. Let me give you the last one. And not only do we see feet tracks and feet trouble, but I want to see, I want you to see the last one is feet trampling. Trampling. I want you to turn all the way back to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3. And I'm thankful for our Savior, aren't you? I'm thankful for the work that He did on the cross of Calvary. And I want you to see the feet of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, I hope that many of you are already familiar with this passage of Scripture. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Now notice what it says. And thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, the cross of Calvary would bruise the heel of our Savior. Oh, that heel would take, and I feel like the heel of Jesus Christ gave a mortal wound to the head of Satan. I'm thankful that our greatest enemy, our greatest foe has received a blow uh, from our Savior, from the foot of our Savior, gave him a good right in the head. And listen, every it doesn't matter how powerful Satan is, and he is a powerful foe. He's been defeated by our Savior. He's under his feet. Now I'm thankful that the feet of our Savior trampled uh, the devil himself. But did you know that we also have a part in that? Did you know that we also have a part in the trampling of our Savior, the Lord Jesus? Uh, we have a part of the trampling of our enemy, uh, Satan himself. Would you turn now with me back to the book of Romans, and we're in Romans chapter 10. Turn with me six chapters more to the very last chapter, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and while you turn there, I want to read to you the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 52 and verse 7. All the Word of God says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Let me ask you tonight, how beautiful are your feet? Are your feet beautiful? I'm not talking about if you just had a pedicure. I'm not talking about the sandals that you're wearing. I'm not even talking about the new socks with the stripes on them that you're wearing. How beautiful are your feet? The Bible says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings tidings, that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. In the book of Nahum, Nahum says it this way, chapter 1 and verse 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, uh, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Oh, how beautiful are the feet of the child of God that are tracks with the gospel. Getting those four verbs out. Going, uh, teaching, baptizing, and teaching. May God help us to make those tracks. May we recognize the trouble in the child of God's life when our feet get cold, when they begin to get dirty. They're the first thing to get dirty about us. Then look at this trampling. We see it first with our Savior when he trampled the head of our greatest foe, our enemy, uh, Satan himself. But then look with me at Romans chapter 16. 
Romans chapter 16, and I want to give you just a few words, okay? Just a few words. Now, there's some names in here I can't pronounce, and I don't know if there are any of you are like me. When we get to the book of Chronicles, I just get the first letter, <laughs> and I just keep rolling on. I think the Lord forgive me for that. And, and I've, I've, I've actually got a little better than that here recently. I just let somebody read it for me. I'll take my phone, I'll hit the play button, I'm like, oh, that's how that's pronounced. Wow, I would have never guessed that. And I think to myself, boy, oh boy, I'm glad I didn't live in Bible times. Fred is so easy. <laughs> Notice in verse 1, Romans chapter 16, Phoebe, our sister, which was a servant. Would you mark that word servant? And then look with me at verse 2. She hath succored, uh, she hath been the succorer of many, the supporter, the comforter of many. Then look with me at verse 3. Greet uh, Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers. Would you mark that word helpers in Christ Jesus? Look down in verse 6. Greet Mary who hath bestowed much labor. Oh, she's a worker. She's a worker. Look all the way down to verse 12. I'm not even going to try to pronounce those names. It says, who labor in the Lord. And then there's another name. Which labored much in the Lord. All these are labors. Notice verse 19. For your obedience is come and brought unto all men. Here we see obedience there. And then notice what it says in verse 21. Timotheus, my fellow what? Worker. A uh, work fellow, I'm sorry. Timotheus, my work fellow. And the list goes on and on uh, throughout the book of Romans chapter 16. Do you see the text? Of Romans chapter 16, Paul is greeting those that served with him, whether they were in prison or the, in a local church or even had a home church. All three of those are mentioned in this chapter. And they all have one thing in common, and that's this. They were busy working. Now, I want to show you one of the greatest. Don't, look, don't leave here. Stay right where you're at. Romans chapter 16, because I want to show you something that's absolutely beautiful. What makes the feet of the preacher so beautiful? Oh, number one, he's making tracks with them. He's carrying the gospel. He's presenting the word of God. Number two, he's keeping them out of trouble. He's taking care of his feet because they have a purpose. They have a, God has a plan for his feet. And that's to present the gospel. And then the last thing is this. Not only has our Savior trampled the head of Satan, but look with me. Uh, one last thing at verse 20. Notice what God uses, how God uses us. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under what? Your feet shortly. Under your feet shortly. In other words, I don't think it's going to be long. Do you? Hey, listen. Every time, every time the child of God takes the word of God out and shows someone else how to be saved. Oh, we're trampling uh, the devil himself. Every time a child of God gets the message of salvation, we're just trampling. We're bruising the body. Oh, Jesus got the head. Yes, the devil's a wounded foe. Uh, yes, Jesus brought the victory. But guess what? He also includes the church. Our feet are trampling as we present the gospel. Uh, we're uh, trampling on the body of Satan himself. What a blessing it is to see that our feet are part uh, of what God uses to trample the body of Satan. And you say, Brother Fred, I don't know about that. I don't either. You know why? I'm afraid. Brother Beckett, I'm afraid. I'm afraid because, listen, things have changed. Times have changed. Oh, man. Yes. Things are different. Yes. Becky, you know how we was raised. Miss mm -hmm. Mann, you know how things were. Think about all those years ago, 30, 35 years ago, how preachers were so faithful and how the church was so faithful. How God's people hated sin. Listen, we're so busy pointing our finger at all the wickedness of the world and covering our mouth and uh, being amazed and shocked at how wicked the world is. Listen, we need to forget that and look at the mirror and look at how God's church has went against His plan and look at how God's people are doing evil. We need to take our eyes off a of lost and dying world. Guess what? They're not going to change without Christ. Right. What we ought to be concerned with and what we ought to be shocked at and what we ought to be amazed at is how far the church of God has went against uh, His will and His plan for our lives. Yeah. May God help us to see that we're the problem, not the world. May God help us to see that we're pointing our finger in the wrong place and every time we see a new article in the paper or on Fox News, instead of covering our mouth in amazement, we ought to think, dear God, how much have I prayed? 
How much have I fasted? How much have I read your word? How much have I presented the gospel? How much have I told other people about your great love? God help me to do what I'm supposed to do. Boy, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Satan is, it's as if his work is not being withheld any at all. It's as if he is moving with no reserve in our generation. It's as if God has taken the reins off of dead, the devil and he's moving full force ahead. You say, Brother Fred, why is that? Why has the devil got so much liberty to work in lives and homes? Why is the devil destroying home after home after home? I drive a school bus. I've been driving a school bus for almost 20 years now. I've got the largest bus in the county. It's a 90 passenger. Now, if they're about that big, you can fit 90 of them on there. <laughs> I've got 53 children that I haul every day to the elementary school up there at Ridgeview. That's how many I've got enrolled on my bus in the morning. Of those 53 kids, until it's been three weeks now, until three weeks ago, I had three families on my bus, a mom and dad over those children. Then I come to find out three weeks ago that no, I only had two. Two out of 50 some kids, I've got a mom and dad for two sets of children. America's broken. Amen. You know why America's broken? The church is broken. Amen. The church is out of place. The church is disobedient. The church is outside of God's will. The church is lazy. Amen. The church is lazy. Amen. The church is just downright out defiant against the Word of God. Deliberately disobeying God's plan for their life. The church is outside of God's will. That's why the devil's having a heyday. Let me tell you something. Back in the day, back in the day when the word of God was being presented in our country and when thousands upon thousands upon thousands of doors were being knocked and the gospel was being presented on a regular basis, guess what? Satan was being trampled. Amen. He was being trampled under the feet of God's children. You say, Brother Fred, I knocked on every single door in this neighborhood last year. I did all the way from over at Beaver. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. I've been knocking on doors ever since I can remember. I'm not trying to brag. But you know what I found right here in your neighborhood? You have about three doors down here on the left. About three doors down. And marijuana, marijuana was so strong I couldn't even get into the front door. I ain't blaming the church. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's everywhere. Right. I'm just a man that drug addiction and drug abuse and everything else under the sun. It's everywhere. Here's what I'm saying though. Here's what I'm saying. It's not what it used to be. Because as God's church was busy making foot tracks, God saw their feet was beautiful, and guess what? He was using those feet to trample the body of Satan himself. Would you look at that verse one more time? Romans chapter 16 and verse number 20. I've already shut my Bible, but it won't take me but a minute to find it. And I hope you'll mark it. And let me ask you something. How many marks have you made on the body of Satan? Let me ask you to examine yourself. The Bible says, And God and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. It's not that we're doing the bruising. It's God doing the bruising, but guess what He's using? He's using our feet. I'm not trying to twist the Scripture. God's the one that's still stomping on the devil. Amen? And by the way, we serve a mighty God. He's able to defeat every foe that we have. The, the, the God of heaven is victorious. Period. He's never lost a battle, much less the war. But let me tell you something. God uses His children, and we sure have. How are your feet? In the eyes of God, how pretty are they? It might be that you say, Brother Fred, my feet are pretty. I can wear just about any shoes or any type of thing, and it wouldn't. I don't have to worry about my feet stinking. I don't have to worry about what they look like at all. I've got beautiful feet. They might look beautiful to you and I. But let me ask, in the eyes of God, how beautiful are they? They're only beautiful as they've been making tracks. They're only beautiful as you're keeping them out of the trouble that they get into. They get cold. They get cold. They get dirty. They're only beautiful as they're busy helping God. Just like Paul and all these co-laborers, fellow workers, assisting in the commission that God has given us to get the gospel out. They're beautiful because they carry the gospel. You can't be right with God as a Christian. You can't be right with God any other way. 
May God help us to be busy telling other people about Christ. Would you stand with me, please? We'll pray. I want to give just a moment of invitation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we're all guilty. Lord, there's not a person in the room that could say that we're innocent of the sin of not telling someone about Jesus. Lord, we all miss opportunities. Father in heaven, I pray you'd reveal to us heaven. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do a supernatural work to convict our hearts and show us our need of taking care of our feet. Lord, how important they are. May they be beautiful in your eyes. I ask all this in the name of Jesus. With your head still bowed and your